Jeremiah, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, cool. Hey, uh, you're the founder of, 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 of Crowd Companies. What is Crowd Companies? Crowd Companies is a brand council for business leaders at large companies that want to figure out how to share and make and collaborate with the crowd. And, and how do you do that? Well, we, we connect our members to the ecosystem and we connect them to each other. We have private events and online uh, courses. We bring in experts like Lisa Gansky, Mark Hatch, uh, uh, Neil will come and present, many of the folks who you've interviewed uh, come and share and teach them. And then three, we connect them to startups that want to partner with big companies and then hopefully they can uh, be part of this collaborative and sharing economy. And, and what way can they really implement this collaborative sharing economy into the system? Because I've been talking to quite some corporates lately and uh, when talk, uh, it's, it's quite, quite hard to change. So, so, so what what is the way that you really make these companies make the change? Sure. Well, I mean, there's a couple of famous Dutch companies that are already doing it. Uh, KLM has a property on Airbnb. They're using underutilized resources and turn an old plane into a luxury apartment and they, they can allow people to use that underutilized space. Also, Shapeways, a 3D printing uh, factory, people don't want to own a 3D printer. You're not going to use it. So they're sharing it and that's spun out of Philips. And so we're already seeing some big companies figuring out how to be part of this space. There's over a hundred case examples of big brands that are partnering with makers or allowing for crowdfunding or sharing their own assets. And so we're just at the start. And so really that's the real crux. I'm trying to bring the sharing and collaborative economy to these big corporations because that's really where we're going to see world changing things happen. Yeah, because uh, last week at the uh, web in Paris you said, okay, uh, 2015 will be the year of the crowd. The year of the crowd, that's right. And really what we did is we showed that how it's expanding this collaborative economy, the crowd economy, into all of these sectors in our society. The original diagram, the honeycomb, started off with six hexes. Yeah. At the top it had goods then food, services, transportation, space, and money. And in each of those hexes, you would see peer-to-peer -peer models or on-demand models or makers. <coughs> but essentially, the crowd is able to get what they need from each other. So that was what we launched in May. Last week in Paris, December 2014, mm -hmm. we've updated the honeycomb. And I had input from people like Neil and Lisa and other, other important folks. And it's expanded into so many other industries and verticals. So there's 12 now hexes. So here's number seven, uh, healthcare and wellness. We're seeing peer-to-peer -peer healthcare from Israeli startup called helparound.co, where diabetic patients share their insulin and blue glucose monitors with each other when they're traveling, if you're missing stuff. Mm -hmm. There's even um, an Uber for doctors, STAT or Medicast. You push a button and they can come to you on demand. So you're activating idle doctors to come to you. In number eight, the hexagon, we see logistics. The crowd is delivering things long distance or they're even doing local delivery. Like for example, Instacart partnered with a very well-known grocery store called Whole Foods in America to deliver groceries to people's homes and really activating idle time. And that extends the business model for Whole Foods. So that's logistics. And here in San Francisco, this is the second most d dense city in America. So people are sharing their closet space with each other on roost. So that's logistics. In the next uh, hex, we also see that even corporations are building their own software for inside of companies. Tilt.com allows any company to build their own branded crowdfunding site. Near Me, a San Francisco company, is enabling Cisco to you let their channel partners resell used networking gear instead of throwing it away. So big companies are tapping these resources as well. And the next hex is utilities. Van de Braun, Dutch company, is enabling peer-to-peer -peer power sharing. And then we're seeing crowdfunding of power with Solar Mosaic out of uh, San Francisco area. And then even utilities are being shared like Wi-Fi, phone, F-O-N, shared Wi-Fi is very popular in Europe. And we're seeing even people share their own telecom uh, through Bluetooth or other types of peer-to-peer -peer chat with Fire Chat. Two more. Uh, the next one is uh, cities are getting in the game. You've heard of the term B to B or P to P. What about C to C, city to city? Muni Rent enables cities 
to share tractors and unused goods with each other. Imagine if Amsterdam shared with Utrecht their different tractors that are not being used. Some cities in America are actually generating revenue by renting those trucks or things to each other. <clears throat> and then the last one is even universities are being augmented, if not disrupted, through peer-to-peer -peer and crowd-based learning platforms like Maven, Skillshare, Instructables, and then there's even instructor-led ones like um, uh, Khan Academy. So wow, I just went through 12 sectors. Every part of our society is being impacted by the collaborative economy through peer-to-peer -peer commerce or on-demand business models. Yeah. This is a movement. I totally agree. I mean, I'm also really curious about it because you see lots of, 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 of new crowd companies, they're growing really, really fast. What do you think? Uh, because uh, uh, the last weeks uh, there was quite some 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 media attention on, on some things uh, from the Uber culture. Uh, it's it's really hard to 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 build a sustainable company uh, for the future in in this really small time gap. And what way do you think those those company can can manage also to to be successful on long <coughs> on, on, on long term? Because I think like with Uber, I think the biggest challenge for Uber is Uber itself. So so what do you think that's and what way can they learn <coughs> to, to grow at the right way? Yeah, there's been plenty and said about in the media about uh, uh, the companies and their shortcomings. But what I'd like to do is focus on one of the startups out of Europe that I think will matter and they're growing very fast. And that's French-based Blah Blah Car. And they were on stage with me at La Web and I had a chance to interview the, the, the founder, Frederick uh, Mazzilla. And during the interview, I said, how, how are values and ethics important to you? It seems like that's one of the decision makers of what people do when things are expanding so quickly. So that's important. Values are going to be really important to startups because when it scales, the management team can't keep track of everything. So you have to set those values up in advance. <clears throat> With that said, Blah Blah Car Frederick, the CEO, put, whipped out of his jacket <laughs> all these cards yeah, of values. They're cool, I know. Yeah, yeah, you've seen them. So things like uh, fun and business and uh, check but verify, trust but verify. And he said all these different values that teach people what to do when he's not there, if he's not sitting with you, he's not behind you, he's not in a meeting with you. And I said, did you just make that for just this meeting to look good in front of 4,000 people? And of course, Lyft was on the couch as well at Airbnb. Uh, and he said, no, Jeremiah, this is something in our whole company. So I went to go visit them the next day. And what do you know? There's posters, there's uh, note cards where people are doing that. <clears throat> so Fred made it clear that values and ethics will matter. And I think that could be a major differentiator over time. And, is, and do you also see a, 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 a difference in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the US startups and the European startups in, in, in values or in, in, in whatever? Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I generally think that it comes down to the individual leader, not necessarily the startups themselves. However, Silicon Valley, where we, we're in San Francisco right now, uh, the startups are encouraged to be disruptive. And uh, some of the startups, CEOs and entrepreneurs, take pride when they get cease and desist letters. They actually put them up on their walls and wave them. Yay, we've disrupted another big player. Yeah. And, so, and the VCs encourage that disruption because it means they're taking money from somebody else. In other cultures, that may not be the common goal or desire, but here in Silicon Valley, that warlord mentality of disrupting <clears throat> is very common. Yeah. In fact, one of the questions that you go to parties at here in the Valley, people say, so what does your startup do? So who are you disrupting? Yeah. Usually that's the second question. And then the third one is, okay, uh, uh, when is your IPO? Those are becoming less common over time, but yeah, sure, or yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's also very different in, 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 in Europe. But also because you also did some research about uh, the investments in the collaborative economy. There were oh, some yeah. really overwhelming figures. So, uh, can you help me with oh, the Oh, yes. So figures? I've been tracking that pretty closely. And so I've been tracking, I went back and I have 12 years of data. And there's been over 550 funding examples. There's been about 180 startups who have been funded of note that we know of. Of course, there's seed and angel rounds we don't know of. Here's the stats. Social networks, popular social networks like Facebook, MySpace, Friendster, uh, YouTube. Collectively, there's about 17 of them. They've been funded 5.4 billion US dollars. 
the collaborative economy, all of those in the honeycomb that we looked at, have collectively been funded about $8.5 billion. And it's kind of a younger market. Yep. They've been funded over $3 billion in the last phase of sharing social media. But do you think that, that also the collaborative economy is the next phase of social media? So first oh, yes. connecting and Absolutely. now collaborate? So I've been covering and involved in social media for over 10 years. Uh, when I started, I've, so I've, I've done 2,800 blog posts, I've been in the space. I was in the early debates, should we call it user-generated content, citizen media, social networks, or social whatever. Uh, so I was in those early discussions, just like we're fighting over terms again in the collaborative economy, sharing economy, peer to con, whatever you call it. Yeah. Okay, so I've been through this 10 years and I was a forestry analyst tracking it. I know the phases, so I've seen all this before. And so that was the first phase when people could create media and share media using commonly available technologies. That's 10 years ago. Facebook was created in 2004, okay? 2014 today. People can create their own goods through crowdfunding and the maker movement, and then they can share what they already have through the sharing economy. We can call this the collaborative economy. And they're using commonly available technologies, if not the same exact technologies, mobile, social, internet of things, cloud, big data. And what's next? What, uh, what's the next step after the collaborative economy? Well, we didn't finish our discussion on funding, <laughs> but we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so, social networks were funded about 5.4. Collaborative economy has been funded almost 8.5. A, uh, a lion's share of that is Uber, followed by Airbnb. But then there's Indian-based ride-sharing companies, and then there's Lyft, uh, and then there's Indiegogo, and Kickstarter, and there's a lot of others out there. But what it means is that these startups have been funded so much, they're not going away by any means. Yeah, I do agree. But do you also, uh, uh, I think that, that, that there's, there's also a difference between the US and Europe. Uh, in Europe, the, the, the funding rates are this high. Like with BlaBlaCar, they raised 100 million. 100 million. It was extraordinary for a, a Right, a, a, but Uber's a raised 2.5 billion or yeah, something like so that. Uh, and Lyft, quite is, a, uh, Lyft is already, I think over that amount and can certainly go higher than that amount. Yeah, interesting. And yeah. but when you look at uh, the, uh, what they do is is, is is new. But when you look at the model of the ownership and also uh, with organization, that's the old school way. So, what do you think about that? Is 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 it also a healthy situation, or do we also have to look at different way in funding and different way in 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 yeah. in, 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 in uh, the ownership and organizations? So when you interview Neil, you might hear some wonderful perspectives on w what these models could look like, and and he raises some very valid points on is this really the new economy or is this just a repeat of capitalism? And I believe it is a continued capitalism, and I believe that's how it's going to stay. I'm going to have a pretty hard stance on that. Mm -hmm. And the reason is when you have that much investment from venture capitalists, it means that they need their money returned to them in five years. And typically they want five to ten times return in their valuation. Yeah. It means they need to force more value, they need to generate more revenues, and that means more monetization. Yeah. They are equity holders, they own the company. They control the board and they will de determine and dictate the route of the, the, who the CEO will be. Yeah, I do understand, but yeah. in, the, in the end, um, is that a healthy situation? Because, uh, oh, uh, yes, uh, so let's answer that. As you know, because <coughs> uh, I did the brand expedition, I interviewed 20 uh, brand leaders in Europe, yeah. and in Europe there are lots of family companies, and when you look at a family company, they say, okay, if, uh, if I invest $1,000 or $1 million today, right. I don't need to have the profit in mm -hmm. one or five years. So we're building on a long-term uh, no, stable model. Years. This is five-year return. Um, I think we're in very tenuous times. I think we are walking on thin ice. I think this is a potential danger for the whole space um, if it's not sorted out. Now, there's three things to balance. Let's be very clear. Uh, the, there's the three Ps. There's platforms, which are the software, like Uber.com, mm -hmm. Airbnb.com, blah, 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 car.com. There's the providers, hosts, drivers, task rabbits, uh, crowdfunders, people who give money. Mm -hmm. And then there's the partakers, the riders, the guests, uh, the folks that are actually um, um, hiring somebody else for their time. So understand those three things. All three must be in balance. They all yeah. must win or the system falls apart. It's a very delicate balance. 
Now, in most of the markets, there's healthy competition of different startups doing different things. Uh, so there's always alternatives. Pretty much in all the spaces. I mean, Airbnb looks like a, a dominant player, but there's still home exchange and some other players out there, couch surfing, one fine stay, although Airbnb has a lion's share for, uh, for sure. Uh, but with that in place, there's going to be some healthy market uh, uh, balance. And that is capitalism in its raw sense, to enable the providers and partakers, the people, the options so they can choose between which platform to use. And I believe that is good. I believe that is healthy. I am pro-capitalism on this. Um, but with that said, there was a reason why governments put medallions in place to, to stop price gouging with taxis or put limits on whether hotels can raise caps during emergencies and crises. Like we're seeing right now, uh, ride-sharing car companies are being called out for um, having surge pricing during terrorist attacks right now in, in different parts of the world. So there is a, a place for government to put regulation, safety, and some control so things don't overheat. Mm -hmm. Where that balance lies, it's un unknown yet. Yeah. This is a new economy. And this is why government leaders all around the globe, World Economic Forum, Davos, EU, the United States government, the, the South Korea government is all looking at this space, UK as well. And do you also connect the, 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 the crowd companies with governments? Because I think there's some really interesting yeah. things to think about. The first year of crowd companies, and we're one year old now, and there's 50 corporations in, so we've had tremendous growth, all Fortune 500, by the way. Uh, we were really just trying to learn and understand the space, and there was a lot of education done, and there was a lot of um, um, speeches done by the startups. Over time, we'll figure out how do we fit with cities, but really, uh, Martin, our focus has been around business models and the relationship between corporations and the people. Uh, there are other expert folks like April, Neil, uh, Lisa, who, uh, Gansky, who know the city spaces a little bit better than I do. So I would probably turn to them to learn from them as well. Yeah. So not saying no, but I don't think the time is right for us to get too involved in that yet. And also during your talk uh, in Paris, you also say that that's, uh, uh, the, the disruptive uh, companies this year will realize what's happening and they will start acting and, and responding? Oh, it's already happening. So Martine, there, there's the, the taxi lobbyists have staged protests at the Airbnb conference. There were protests against Airbnb. Um, there's a whole website of the hotels who launched their own campaign against uh, uh, home sharing. So you, there's been taxis even in, in, I'm sure in Amsterdam, there certainly were in many other cities. The escargot protest where the ta taxi cabs mm -hmm. came into the city center and stopped traffic which in, resulted in an increase in downloads to Uber. So it really didn't work, but we're, we're definitely seeing the pushback happen. Now, I wanna be really clear on the crowd company's view. We actually have a mission. The mission statement of the council is empowered people and resilient brands for shared value. So it means there's a partnership working together. So our organization, if you're trying to fight this movement, this is not the place for you. If you want to lead and lean forward and have a new relationship with the crowd and, and find new business models and, and lead and partner with the crowd, crowd companies is the place for corporations. Yes, yeah, yeah, but I think that's the only right approach because in the end, fighting against something and fighting against innovation is just a matter of time. And in the end, the, the reason why Airbnb is growing this fast is yeah. that the, the hotel industry missed something. So the and best thing they can do is and to yeah. watch, okay, what do we miss? And then learn from that. You know, technically, if you're fighting this movement, you're fighting the internet. So if you think you can stop the internet, you can probably fight this. Yeah, yeah. And um, what do you think are, are the most important lessons uh, corporations can learn from the startups? Uh, because you have done quite some, quite some sessions uh, the, the last year of crowd companies. What are the, 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 the most interesting lessons learned from the first year? Oh, that's a great question. I think that the, the big corporations are learning that these people are no longer consumers. They're crowd funders, they're makers, they're turning their homes into hotels, their cars into taxis, they're destined to miniature offices. They're like micro entrepreneurs. They're like empowered people. They're not consumers. So that's kind of been the big mindset change for many corporations. But you know, Martin, we've seen this before. 10 years ago, when the rise of social media happened, 
marketers and customer care professionals and PR professionals realize that you can't call them the audience anymore. They're now participants. They're now the media, citizen media, people media. And so we had to reframe the relationship and give the people a voice, even on the corporate websites, to talk on their behalf. So that same pattern is repeating yet again 10 years ago uh, now. The crowd is becoming like a company. And so we have to think of them as a partner or an ally, as Jerry Mikowski says. And what do the, uh, the, the startups learn from the, uh, being a part of the crowd companies, from the corporates? Uh, I will joke that the startups learn why big corporations don't innovate quickly because sometimes the sales cycle can be nine months, 18 months. It's incredibly long mm -hmm. for startups to work with big brands sometimes. So they learn about big company bureaucracy and um, they understand that. So many of the startups that I do meet have never worked with corporations before. They don't have that DNA or background. Many of the, the entrepreneurs are first time entrepreneurs in this space. So they, they haven't matured their company in the last rounds. So they're having to learn some new skills. Um, they're learning from both sides. It's like new economy and old economy coming together. But the change is, um, it's not traditional consumers now. The crowd is like a company. Yeah. And uh, this year you're also, or in, in, in 2015, you're also going to Europe with, uh, with crowd companies? Yes, we are very proud. We have a number of European companies that are members like Barclays and uh, Nestle and Swisscom. And there's a number of other European companies that are European-based uh, headquartered companies that are looking to join the council. So we're looking to expand it. And I do invite the Dutch companies of note. Uh, so please join and let's come together and do things. So we're planning to do some events uh, in Europe and grow. Okay, the, uh, are there also venues or, or, or uh, data uh, available of the events? Uh, not yet to announce, but if you bookmark crowdcompanies.com or sign up to the newsletter, we'll be sure, or just send me an email, we'll be sure to let folks know. Yeah. And the last topic about leadership, uh, leadership in a collaborative economy, because I'm really interested in in, in what kind of leadership do you see, especially uh, uh, one side with the startups, and other sides with the companies, the corporates who are willing to change? Yeah. Are there some, some insights you can share about that? So let's talk about the startup entrepreneurs. Um, interestingly enough, most of the CEOs and, and founders that I've met of the startups, that, and most of them now, many of them now are worth billions. Not millions, billions. Um, they actually are altruistic in nature. They didn't start this to get rich. They either had a vision for sustainability, like John Zimmer at Lyft. He wants to reduce the number of empty seats in cars. He wants pe more people in more cars, in less cars. And then uh, Brian Chesky over at Airbnb, they were just passionate about a design conference and helping to get people to you know, a political event. And they saw a need and they just wanted to grow it. Uh, and they're infusing their design skills, of course, and passions into the company. So people are coming uh, into this space not because they want to get rich. They tend to have a greater mission. And I think that's completely in line with the movement and how most millennials think today. Now, on the corporate side, um, I like to call these folks uh, catalysts inside of corporations. They want to make change. And they really are like intrapreneurs. Uh, inside of their own company that really want to change from the inside. And they too are also very innovative and passionate about making a difference. They're probably not just driven by career motivation. That's not the primary reason. They want to see the world in different places. So they're very similar on both of those routes and how they work together. And I see a lot of wonderful relationships that are going to continue to build in that way. Yeah, cool. And we also see, uh, um, because uh, the, the first generations uh, of platforms like Airbnb, uh, let's say there was a, a coincidence or a passion for, for, for different reasons, uh, they started it. Uh, but now people see, okay, uh, your 8.4 8 billion uh, investments, uh, there's also some money to get. We also see now a, a different kind of entrepreneurs with the startups who, uh, with different motivations, or is no. it, of, doesn't it no. change? No, I actually don't. So I, there's 9,000 startups in, the, in this space, says Lisa Gansky's the Mesh Directory. Uh, I definitely have not met 9,000 people, but the, I'm definitely meeting the popular ones. And they are not doing this just for raw market valuation. They are really doing this because they want to make a difference. I, I, I can hear it. And I know what it looks like when the money 
players come in. I saw that with social media. I knew when the tipping point came, when there was just the uh, the suits came in. I could feel it. We're definitely not here yet. And and what can you then learn from what happened with social media uh, uh, when you look at sure. the collaborative economy? There's some direct parallels, and I feel very blessed that I've been through that last movement. They're very very similar, app based driven, but uh, you know, uh, peer to peer both sides. So the next changes that we'll see is the APIs or the, the application platforms. And for those of you that don't know what the APIs are, this is really um, a, a software platform that the startups will enable other people to build apps on top of it and connect to their system. If you've heard of Facebook and all their apps like Zynga that's set on top or Slides or all these apps or these mm -hmm. games, that's a great example. Another example is Apple created a platform for people to create their own media on top of their, their um, company. That's called iTunes. Uber launched their version, the Uber API. I believe Lyft has no choice but to join and then blah, blah, car. And Airbnb will too, they can't fall behind. Because once one player goes, they could set the standard for the entire industry. And if the other players don't follow suit, they fall way behind because the rest of the developers and the startups and the ecosystems and the analytics players will attach to that one. Yeah. Once that happens, Google moves into the space and so does Facebook. So that's the next play to watch for, is the interconnectivity. Now what that means is we might start to see sharing of reputations or identities. So if you're a five-star blah blah car rider, what if you could transfer that to Airbnb? I'm a five-star uh, rider, I'm probably gonna be a good guest. And could that transfer over to your credit score or to banks? Yeah. You see, there's lots of interesting permutations that can come out of it like that. And there are also quite some, some issues now uh, uh, starting uh, about privacy and, and about online trust. Well, not starting. What? They've always been here. Yeah, but and I think social networks too. Getting, getting, getting more relevant in the, in the coming years. Yeah. When you look at and I like with your your now you're definitely score. sounding European, by the way. Yeah. Why? Because <laughs> of <laughs> privacy concerns. <laughs> Americans are less concerned about privacy until we're disrupted. No, uh, but I'm really interesting about when you look at uh, like with your uh, reputation data. Um, uh, in the end, uh, uh, like um, I'm using Airbnb a lot, so I'm building a reputation on Airbnb. And when I want to get to home exchange that come, it, that could be a barrier for me because I think, okay, my, uh, I already have a good reputation on Airbnb. Airbnb, can I bring my rotation data with me? Uh, uh, they probably should know. Uh, yeah, Airbnb would not want that to happen to Home Exchange. That would proliferate a competitor. Yeah, I but, understand. But when you look at for, from the customer, blah blah of, car to Airbnb, there's a cultural fit there, so that could work. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do, you, do we know e uh, e, uh, e rates? E rates. There's Rep. There's Trust Cloud. There's um, um, Trady. There's a whole bunch that are in this space trying to figure out shared data and reputation. So it's gonna, I already see the startups emerging. Yeah. There's even analytics startups like Sherpa Share too, that are trying to figure out what is the best time to be a driver across all the platforms. And we're even seeing like ones that like determine the best rates and when you should post for your Airbnb. So we're seeing the data players, the SDKs, the APIs, the reputation players. I'll create a graphic on that in a few weeks that are starting to emerge in this space. And this is, um, I did a similar graphic ten years in the last ten-year run called the Social Business Stack, where I laid out all the different types of software that emerged to support the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And we'll see the same thing. I'll create a collaborative economy stack that yeah. will indicate all these different players. Yeah. So it's I'm, I'm waiting because it's not formalized yet, but it's coming. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And last question: What do you think has to change to make this collaborative economy model sustainable for the future and sustainable that all stakeholders will get maximum value out of this uh, uh, collaboration? Well, it's definitely here to stay. The adoption rates are up and to the right. The funding is up and to the right. The media mentions is up and to the right. Um, but we're going to be going through some hard times in this next year. There's going to be a lot of media criticism around privacy, safety, regulation, 
and then the from another side of the market people are going to say the startups are taking too much value from the people who are creating the system so there's going to be a lot of churn over the next year a lot of online debates and even some of the players like uber appears to be share, they don't use the term sharing economy at all mm -hmm. uh, they look more like an on-demand logistics company so we're seeing deviations emerge in, in like the use cases in the space and that's fine that's healthy and i think all of this debate is healthy and we want to have these we had these same debates in social too there was a bunch of uh, posts by mainstream media that called this attack of the blogs and said the amateurs don't create great content content wikipedia is junk content it you know you can't rely on it and then all the studies came out wikipedia is just as reliable as uh, britannica uh, bloggers and Twitter can beat the journalists to the story, although journalists may be or may not be more accurate. So we saw all these debates happen, and we'll see that same thing happen here again. And I think that is completely normal, completely healthy, and we want to embrace and lead those discussions online. It's actually kind of fun, too. Yeah. So I'm no, I know you'll be a leader in those discussions as well. Thank you. <laughs> it was nice talking to you. It's and my uh, pleasure. Oh, you asked me what's coming next. Don't you want to hear the answer? All right. Okay. So, I'm not going to leave a question out. Um, what's coming next, Jeremiah? Oh, yes. So, what disrupts the crowd? Unfortunately, my friends, it's quite severe. It's the robots. So, I run crowdcompanies.com. Uh, a few months ago, I did purchase robocompanies.com because I know that's what disrupts the, the crowd. Self-driving cars, houses that let you in automatically, Artificial intelligences, uh, those are the things that will disrupt the crowd economy. But don't worry, that's not for a few years off. Uh, but that will be the next phase. Cool, looking forward. Oh, I'm, I hope, I'm sure you are. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait either. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir.